Good morning and welcome everybody to St. John's Episcopal Church to this AGO uh, Tulsa chapter workshop with Dr. Damon Spritzer from the organ faculty at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Joseph Arndt. I'm privileged to serve as the Dean of the Tulsa chapter and also to serve here at St. John's Episcopal Church. I invite you to look at the video description on YouTube where you can find the program for today. There are a lot of resources that Dr. Spritzer has in, included for our enjoyment, and you can also follow along with that. I also invite you, if you're joining us online or in person, to go back later and subscribe to our chapter YouTube channel. We currently have 101 subscribers, so that's great. So we're above 100, that magic number we were hoping to get. So I do encourage you, if you're new to our chapter resources, to watch our other events from this past fall, and we will certainly have other online and in-person events to be announced in the coming months. Now I'd like to uh, welcome to St. John's and to the Tulsa chapter, Dr. Damon Spritzer. Good morning. <laughs> thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you to those who are watching online. I hope that you will enjoy some of the music that I have put together for today. For all of us as organists, we have hundreds of years of literature to choose from, and then we need to be mindful of the uh, history and tradition affiliated with whichever church we are serving, and with the needs and wishes of our clergy and congregation, as well as the vast differences between the instruments that we play everywhere. I know during my various positions as a church organist, uh, there was a church where we had the expectation of very extended major works for voluntaries, 10 minutes was not a problem. And then another church where not only did the voluntaries need to be three minutes or less, they were incorporated into the service and the director of music appreciated it and encouraged me to make certain the voluntaries were in the same key as the choral introit each week. So that led to a lot of very merry sleuthing and discovering a lot of beautiful smaller works. And then to become a full-time teacher of organ literature and history, it's delightful to make sure that all of our students are exposed to the canon, to the Bach and to the Franck and to the Vidor and to the Howells, but there are so many smaller works, not only by the composers that we already love, but by composers who, by the sheer virtue of the chance they didn't write a major work, we don't give them as much attention because we have only 52 Sundays plus feast days, depending on your background. So I take a lot of pleasure in adding that music to my own programming and to my own church work. And we have such tremendous resources online for the handout that I've provided today. Not everything is in print. Nearly everything is available on IMSLP, or in the case of living composers, I provided you with contact information for their websites, and I would really encourage you, if any of those works resonate with you, to support our contemporaries who are writing wonderful music for us to play, as well as to uh, dig into the resources of IMSLP, which are just absolutely extraordinary. So rather than me give you an organ recital today, I have compiled playlists, which are also, they're unlisted on YouTube, but the links are at the bottom of the handout. And if anybody who is online is unable to access that program, send me a message, and I will gladly send you the handout as well as the connections for the playlists. There are a few pieces on the handout that I won't demonstrate today. Likewise, there are a few pieces in the playlists for which I could not locate scores. We know they're out there, but because of COVID, so many libraries are closed. Interlibrary loan has been for a time suspended and now even it's challenging to find work. So if there are things that you'd like to add to it or explore further, I really hope that you will. So I'll talk a little bit about each composer and play some sound examples for you as we go through. And we've tested our speaker, but thank you again for being here. I could talk about organ music all day, so thank you. 
I thought I'd start. I divided them into categories for opening and closing voluntaries as a very general idea of things that are more meditative and things that are perhaps more festive. And interspersed throughout the program are some that are specific for perhaps Christmas or Advent or Pentecost and things like that. But many of them are general. And I think they're really, really lovely. The first piece I'll play a little bit of for you. Because of time constraints, I'll probably limit it to just two or three minutes of each work for which I have a sound clip. Edouard Batiste, this is an elevation, opus five. He was a French organist and composer of the 19th century, born in 1820, and he, of course, won many prizes as a youth, already very, very talented, including the Prix de Rome. He was the organist in Paris for 12 years and then ended up at Saint-Eustache, which, of course, is a church we all know from uh, famous, Ameri uh, famous composer Jean Guillou. Um, so sorry, I was trying to recall his recent passing. Um, and uh, Edouard Batiste actually performed the organ for the premiere of Hector Berlioz's Te Deum in 1855. But this is a very beautiful, smaller meditative work called Elevation. instruments, but very beautiful, very restful, very peaceful. Of course, there are more works by almost every composer on this list, but this is just representative, and if these works appeal, I hope you'll look at their other offerings, particularly if you can locate those on IMSLP, and it's very easy to, to browse. Rene Becker, I've listed in both preludes and postludes for some ideas because he wrote really, really wonderful toccatas and marches, and very, very beautiful. He was a lifelong church musician and always had liturgical needs in mind. The uh, Cantilena is a more extended piece, but it's very beautiful, but he wrote a number of smaller things as well, uh, and that can easily be found. Nadia Boulanger is a name that nearly all of us will recognize as an incredible pedagogue and theory professor and composition professor, but not so much always as a composer, despite the fact that she did write some for organ. Uh, she taught many of the most important and leading composers and musicians of the 20th century and did occasionally perform. She was from a very musical family and gave up writing music to become the teacher that influenced so many generations of composers. Uh, Daniel Berenboom, Aaron Copeland, John Elliott Gardner, Philip Glass, George Baker, Dr. Baker, who is one of the composers that we'll discuss later on. She was the first woman to conduct many major orchestras in America and Europe, including the BB Symphony and the Boston Symphony, which is absolutely wonderful. But she wrote some very beautiful smaller organ works. This is a prelude.
about them, but if we listened to all of them, we'd be here much longer than the allotted time. But it's very interesting to hear some of the organ music by such an important person who was really so very influential. Marco Enrico Bossi was a very interesting figure in the organ world. He was an Italian organist, composer, improviser, and pedagogue. Um, his father was also an organist. This so often is the case with uh, legacies and musical families. He had brothers, and he studied in Bologna and at the Milan Conservatory. He was director of music and organist at Como Cathedral, and then later became the professor of organ at the Naples Conservatory, but he also worked at a number of other conservatories. He was very well known as a virtuoso performer, of course, and traveled a great deal. In November 1924, he embarked on a recital tour to New York and Philadelphia where he played the Wanamaker organ, which we all love and want to play, and he also played at Wanamaker's store in New York City, which allegedly at the time had an organ. However, he was ill on his U.S. trip, and he died at sea on his return, but he left us all kinds of very virtuosic, very fabulous organ music, but also some smaller, lovely things. charming, makes me think of spring now that we've had some beautiful weather. In uh, my organ literature classes, as we move through the countries and the eras and the composers, after most pieces, I'll turn to them and say, would you play it? And, you know, because we need to be able to talk about, objectively and subjectively, how they respond and how they think a congregation or a recital audience might respond. And I get a lot of nods for music of this character because it's, it's very gentle. And I think that's something to really be appreciated, especially depending on context. But it can make the organ very lovely. Um, moving on, and of course, Bosi wrote a great deal of, of other music. Christopher Durnley was a very important British organist for a very long time. He uh, was educated at the Cranley School and was organ college in Oxford, but became organist at St. Paul's for a very, very long time, and w retired there, I believe, around 1990. He received many awards and was very important with the Men and Boys Choir, but was a fabulous, fabulous organist, really wonderful 
a wonderful performer. And this is a small chorale prelude that I discovered very much by accident a few years ago. It's very beautiful. The hymn tune that this is based on, Dominus, Dominus Regid Mei, is found in the 1982, but it's not in all hymnals. And it was a new tune to me, but this is a very beautiful, very plaintive modern chorale setting that I think is quite lovely. And this is being played at St. Paul's Cathedral, his church. I just love that. The shifting meter in the score when you're actually playing it is very interesting, but it's just a little thing. Three and a half minutes, very beautiful on a wonderful hymn tune that we don't always get a chance to sing. Moving to America, David Dahl may be somebody that, that several of you know already. American professor, composer, pedagogue, organist, church musician. Um, he is in the Pacific Northwest. His parents were Norwegian, so there is an influence of that in his life and his works, but he's received a number of distinguished alumni awards from Pacific Lutheran University and from the Episcopal Diocese and from the Oregon Historical Society. He's also been very much an advocate for new and historic mechanical pipe organs and has been an organ consultant very active in the Pacific Northwest, which happens to be where I grew up, though I did not meet him when I was a child there. We weren't anywhere near each other. But for one of the living composers that I wanted to feature, there's this very beautiful aria that he wrote for his mother,
very sweet, very meditative, contemplative, perhaps a Lenten, if you are in a church where you play music during Lent. We have next a small transcription that I happen to personally really love because I'm very attached to the music of John Ireland, as are many of us. I wish he had written more for the organ, but this is a small transcription of his elegy for strings from the Downland Suite that was further transcribed for organ by Alec Rowley, who is a composer that uh, wrote a wonderful, wonderful, very large volume of repertoire for the organ that's very rarely heard. But John Nicholson Ireland uh, mostly wrote for piano and a number of songs and things like that. He was born into a family of Scottish descent, but he entered the Royal College of Music in 1893 studying under Walter Parrott, as did so many at that time. He also studied composition with Charles Villiers Stanford, who, as I understand from some memoirs, was a very firm teacher, and Ireland was very sensitive and struggled, but always spoke with admiration of his teacher. He began to make his name in the early 1900s, really, and wrote a fantastic, huge rhapsody for the organ that's very powerful and very virtuosic. But this elegy in E-flat is in arch form, so it gives you a chance on an organ like this, for example, a beautiful chance to show off the colors and then to come back down to the quietest stops. And it's not terribly long. This is not the Ireland, I apologize. This is the dark elegy. I apologize. The John Ireland we will come to. But again, it's only three pages in that arch form, similar to the, the Ireland. very exciting with all the reeds, and then it comes down to very soft at the end. Harold Dark was, of course, a British uh, musician who played at St. Michael's Cornhill for a very, very long time, and if I recall correctly, he had the, that is the organ that he played at Cornhill, had the longest running recital series in the country for a very, very long time, which was an interesting distinction, but wrote beautiful music for organ, and I met his grandson once when I was last in England. It was quite a surprise. He was handing out programs at Wells Cathedral and asked me if I'd ever heard of his grandfather, and I said, who's your grandfather? <laughs> and he told me, and I nearly fell over. There was also a cathedral cat, so that was a very, very happy day between meeting such a distinguished person of such distinguished musical lineage and having a cat. So back to France a little bit, to Eugène Gigou, who is a name that we probably know from the Gigou Toccata, which I bet most of us have played and or taught. Gigou was uh, born in 1844 and lived until 1925, and he was born in Nancy and died in Paris. He studied with Camille Sanson, and he served as the organist at Saint Augustin for 62 years, nearly rivaling Charles Marie Vidor's slightly longer tenure at Saint Sulpice. The Toccata is something that we're all very familiar with, but he wrote a number of other pieces. So this is his communion from his suite for six pieces.
It's very beautiful, quite a contrast to the Takata or some of the other works. Shugu was a wonderful composer and teacher and had a very interesting life and was very, very much liked, but because he didn't leave us any works of enormous stature like symphonies, we overlook his many collections of smaller works, which have both very light and lovely works as well as some that are more challenging. Staying in France a little bit, Alexander Guillemont, of course, we do know because he did leave us sonatas and organ symphonies, which are extraordinary, and he was very, very important and interesting. He was the organist of La Trinité from 1871 until 1901, and he was a very important teacher and pedagogue, performer, improviser. He helped found the Scola Cantorum in Paris, and he was, of course, professor of organ at the Paris Conservatoire in 1896. He was born in Meudon, which of course is affiliated with the Dupre family as well. Um, but he published a number of scores that were very interesting as the t at the time. He was one of the first organists at that time who began looking at masterworks from the past, which was very interesting. And that did have somewhat of an influence on him as well. He left us a number of collections, I believe. Many of those have been reprinted by Wayne Leopold and you can find them. But he himself also wrote much more than just those wonderful sonatas that we love. This is the Impression Gregorian, Gregorian Impression. <laughs> It's very lovely, it goes on for about five or so minutes, which can, it is sectional, so there are ways to, to work with that, but one of his smaller works that we almost never hear. Now we come to the Ireland. I misspoke about the dark elegy before because I love elegies and have a whole pile of them, and so I conflated those in my mind. This is the Ireland transcription of the Downland elegy, originally written for string orchestra, and it's really very beautiful and rarely played. Again, it's only about three and a half minutes long, so it gives you a chance to warm up the registration a little bit to, to invite people in, and then it closes back down. But it's a very beautiful transcription. It is known, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone play it live other than some students, and I absolutely adore it. It's very beautiful for church work or for even a recital where you want to show off some of the colors of an organ. Josef Jungen 
we know, of course, from his fabulous uh, Symphonie Concertante from 1926. One of my favorite performances of that that you can find online is Virgil Fox, because he's having a blast, and it's a spectacular performance, but it's been performed by a number of other people, Olivier Lutry, uh, Jean Guillou, Michael Murray. It's probably one of his best known pieces along with the Sonata Eroica, these massive virtuosic works. But he also wrote a large number of smaller, very, very beautiful pieces of music that, again, we simply don't hear as often depending on for what we are programming. He was Belgian and he was also a teacher and an organist and a composer and, again, was very precocious as a youth and went to the Liège Conservatory at the age of seven, which is spectacular. When I was seven, I was very happy out in the country <laughs> in Washington State taking piano lessons, not at a conservatory. But this is a, one of his smaller works. It's very lovely. Four pieces for organ, cantabile. It's seven minutes long. But that's one of his smaller works from that set of four that's really lovely. Hopefully none of us are, well, we might still be thinking about Advent and Christmas, but two pieces that if you don't know them, you may wish to for future seasons are next in our list today. Thomas Frederick Harrison Oxley went professionally by Harrison Oxley, and he was a British organist. Um, he was the first English cathedral organist to supplement the boys' voices with girls' voices, actually, and they were doing that in the 1970s, which is wonderful. He was born in 1933. His father was also an organist, and he was extremely talented. And sadly, later in life, in 2003, he had a terrible stroke, after which he had to completely relearn how to play the piano and organ, and apparently he made an absolutely spectacular recovery and lived for several more years before passing away in 2009. But this is an absolutely lovely piece on what is this lovely fragrance, or whence is that goodly fragrance? Beautiful for Christmas Eve, perhaps. And 
in a similar vein, Alec Rowley was, I have heard it both ways from, from English friends, Rowley or Rowley. Alec Rowley wrote this very, very small fantasy on Veni Emanuel. He was an English composer, organist and pianist, lecturer. He wrote on music, was really very prolific. And his music is not often played. It's pretty challenging overall. I recorded his two rhapsodies, which nobody else had ever recorded. He was born in London and went to the Royal Academy of Music and served a number of churches. He was also a broadcaster. But a lot of his music he described as being written for the amateur, what which can be interpreted a number of ways because they're really significant works, but he also wrote piano concerti and a number of, of interesting pieces that are quite large or suites for organ. like we just had Advent, though. It really does. But that's a really lovely work. It's a few pages long. Um, I've enjoyed playing it whenever I've had the chance, and the melody is very prominent throughout, which I think is enjoyable for the congregation. Moving away from Christmas, back to things that are a little more general, Camille Saint-Saëns, a name that doubtless we all know from a number of things, French composer, organist, conductor, and a brilliant pianist, uh, well known for cello concerto, piano concertos, carnival of the animals, and a number of works like that. He was a musical prodigy, made his debut at the age of 10, and then studied at the Paris Conservatory. He was very enthusiastic for music of his day, like Wagner, Liszt, and Schumann, though his own works are very conventionally classical and very traditional. He only held one teaching post and was there for fewer than five years, but he was very important nonetheless, as among the people that he taught were Gabriel Fauré, who took that influence to Maurice Ravel. They adored him and really revered him, but this is a lovely work, A Berceuse by Saint-Saëns. Opus 105, so he's rather prolific. But that sort of brings a conclusion to some of my suggestions for opening voluntaries or gentler recital works if you need something that's a palate cleanser or of a particular texture. And now I would like to turn to the second portion of your handout, which is lesser known closing voluntaries. So it's about to get a lot louder. I'll adjust the speaker if I need to, and they already did a sound check. The first piece that I will play for you by recording is by Albert Alain, and that name ought to sound very familiar. This is the father of the incredibly important um, Marie-Claire Alain, Jean Alain, and they had two additional children as well, Marie-Odile and Olivier. But he 
entered the Paris Conservatory and studied there late and got a first prize for harmony in 1904 and studied counterpoint and worked also with Guillemot, whom we just heard, as well as Louis Vierne. He was a church organist at uh, saint germain en laye and he stayed there until his death. He was very passionate about organ building, which led to the installation of a very unusual organ in their house that was very, very influential, particularly for composer Jean Alain, his son. But this is a really fantastic sortie uh, by Albert Alain. It's only two minutes long, so it really is a great quick sortie if you have a quick succession of services or something. Fantastic piece. His works are a little bit hard to find, but you can locate the scores here and there, and that's a really delightful piece. Dr. George Baker is a dear friend and a colleague of all of us. He is just down south in Dallas. He, again, was a musical prodigy as a child and began to take organ lessons very young. He studied with Robert Anderson at SMU and, very importantly, also with Marie Clairlin and Pierre Cochereau, who was very, very dear to him. He won the Grand Prix de Chartres and has recorded the complete works of Johann Sebastian Bach and Louis Vierne and the, did the world premiere recording of organ music by Darius Mio. He's also a wonderful person and a dear friend. He has written some fabulous pieces, particularly in the last few years, often commissions, but this is his Toccata Gig on the Sussex Carol, and you can purchase this directly from his website, and it's really, really a lot of fun. Let me, here we go. play this. If I recall correctly, this was the clo closing voluntary for the King's College Lessons and Carols broadcast this past year, um, which was really thrilling to see and hear there, but it's a very exciting piece. Uh, Dr. Baker also wrote a beautiful berceuse on Away in the Manger, or Away in a Manger, that's a lovely piece also for Christmas. Very beautiful to hear and supporting a composer who is our neighbor and longtime friend. Claude Balbastre, going back to France, early, earlier in France, was born in 1724, so we're going back a good bit. Um, he settled in Paris in 1750 and played organ there for quite a time and left us a lot of very, very beautiful, very interesting music, but this is a march. You may recognize
It's a lot of fun. I love marches. There are a number of them in the playlist. For example, this next march is by Henri Busset, who was a student of Charles-Marie Vidor, as were so many. He was born in Toulouse and lived until 1973, studied at the Paris Conservatory with César Franck, and was for a while the secretary to Charles Gounod, another name that we are familiar with. He taught a number of people and he married a famous dramatic soprano. He did not leave us a lot for the organ. He orchestrated pieces and composed uh, in another, not so much for us, but did leave us many pieces, but this march is really fantastic. Love that organ, but it's a really fantastic piece and probably his best remembered organ work. There are some preludes and fugues, but I've had a great deal of trouble locating more music by him. Similarly, while we are listening to French marches, there are more, again, I won't apologize because I think there's such delightful pieces for either a recital or for our, our work in the church. Edouard Baptiste, uh, with whom we started the presentation, talking about some opening voluntaries. This is an offertoire in F minor by him. Very festive, a little theatrical, but very festive. <laughs> Augustin Berrier is another French composer. He was born in Paris, and like many composers that uh, we discuss and really appreciate, he was blind from birth, but allegedly he had very large hands, which allowed him to play the organ works of Franck and similar composers with relative ease. He was a celebrated improviser, but he did leave us some written music of significance, including an organ symphony and trois pièces. He died tragically very, very young at the age of 31, unfortunately, but this is a march from his three pieces. elements of Vierne in that, but it's a really fantastic piece. Also, there's a very beautiful elegy that's part of that set that I considered including in the suggested opening voluntaries, but the score I'm almost positive is on IMSLP if I was able to list for it. Moving back to America, I know this is a work that my gracious host, Joseph Arndt, plays and enjoys. David Bednall is a very well-known choral composer, but also has a significant career playing and conducting. He is organist at the University of Bristol and has won many, many prizes for his improvisation as well as his compositions. This is a lovely 
Takata on the Welsh hymn tune. It's a great piece, about three and a half minutes long. I wish we could listen to all of them in their entirety. Um, Boilly is another French composer of the Romantic or earlier period that left us some really wonderful, festive, very beautiful music. However, he was somewhat shunned as Romanticism really took over in France at this time because his music was ever so slightly more classical in style as reforms were coming and things were changing. He was actually dismissed from a church position allegedly for the austerity of his playing. He was too severe when they were seeking music that was more exciting and more energetic and that was challenging for him, but he still played a large part in the developing of French music in the 19th century. He left about 300 pieces behind, particularly chamber music and instrumental pieces for piano or organ. Um, and César Franck and Camille Sanson, both of whom revered classical training and form, revered him as somewhat of a guardian of the classical organ tradition. But this is a very fun um, work for Easter, Offertoir for Easter Day. Before Easter, right? We have, what, two weeks? It's a great piece. It is very theatrical by some standards, but it's really beautiful and very exciting. Staying in France, Mel Bonis is actually Melanie Helene Bonis, but her professional name was Mel Bonis. She was a very prolific French late romantic composer who also wrote more than 300 pieces, including works for piano solo, forehands, organ pieces, chamber music, a very, very prolific composer. She attended the Paris Conservatory where she studied with César Franck. She was born to a rather lower middle-class family and educated very strictly Catholic, but she taught herself the piano. And initially, her parents didn't encourage her to study music, but when she was 12, they finally gave in, where among her fellows in the student body at the conservatory were Claude Debussy, Gabrielle Piernet, and a number of really significant composers. Um, her parents disapproved of her first marriage, and so she had to leave music for a while, but she was still very, very important and wrote some fantastic music. It is hard to find in the public domain, but I'd like to include a little bit of her music today. This is Takata. She died in 1937. Thank you. 
really fantastic music. I believe the first ever complete recording of her organ music was made just a few years ago. I want to say 2016 or 2018. So if you're interested in more of her works, she did leave us, among other things, a collection of a number of organ pieces, and they're really, really fantastic. So her music definitely merits more exploration. Felix Borowski is a British-American composer and teacher who was uh, of Polish descent but born to an English family. His father was also musical, and he studied first with his father. He was taught violin and piano, and then he moved to America to become the director of the Chicago Musical College. Uh, his connection at there continued for quite a while, and he taught composition and was very active in the Chicago musical world. He left for us as organists three large-scale romantic sonatas that were published in 1904, 1906, and 1924, but it's very interesting, attractive music, and here is one of his works. Apologies, that one has not made it to the top of the playlist as was intended. But the music is not too difficult to find. Our colleague and friend, Dr. Christopher Marks, made the world premiere recordings of Felix Borowski's sonatas, so I would encourage you to find those. Um, staying in America, this piece, actually, the computer anticipated my needs. David Briggs is a wonderful British composer uh, and organist who now resides in New York as artist in residence. He was previously at Hereford Cathedral and also at Truro and Gloucester Cathedrals, very influenced by Jean Langley and Pierre Cochereau, is considered to be one of the world's finest improvisers. He's truly brilliant and we were grateful to host him once at OU for his transcription of a Mahler symphony. But this is a really lovely Marsh Episcopal, and he, his music is very exciting and very beautiful and a bit challenging, but this is a wonderful, wonderful work. but that was written in 2000, and it's really very powerful and very exciting. Another march, slightly similarly, there is a great deal of French influence in David Briggs' music. Joseph Caillertz was a Belgian composer and organist, and we don't listen to a lot of his music. When he was a young organist, he studied with Lemons at the Brussels Royal Conservatory, and he won for his prizes there, of course. He served as organist at the Jesuit College in Antwerp and also at Antwerp Cathedral and was the carillon player as well for the city. But he left us this fantastic Marche Solennelle.
very grand and very, very appealing, I think, for a number of liturgical applications. Pierre Cochereau is a name that I've touched on very briefly, uh, very, very important, may he rest in peace, the organist of Notre Dame and an incredible improviser, probably one of the greatest who ever lived and very influential on many, many musicians, including David Briggs and Dr. George Baker, who both knew him and studied with him. He improvised stunning works, but he also left us some written compositions from his life. He was a child prodigy, of course, very musical family, and dedicated his life to a musical career and played at Notre Dame for a very long time. This is his Takata Marche de Roi, March of the Kings. More for Christmas, perhaps. <laughs> uh, staying in France, just briefly, uh, Nicolas Chauveau was born in Kent, but it's of course a very wonderful French name, so it's a good transition. He was music director and master at Dover College and was um, organist at St. Bartholomew the Great. He wrote a number of smaller works for organ, some dedicated to Karg Ehlert, a setting of the communion service. There are three pieces for organ. They're a bit hard to find, but you can locate them. This is his march for organ. about four and a half minutes long, but they're really, really lovely pieces, and it's unfortunate that he didn't write more for us. For a complete contrast, this may be a work that you've heard before, but if not, these are very interesting. The Spanish Batalla, these are battle pieces that use lots of trumpets and are often in C major. This is perhaps the most famous one by Juan Cabanillas, who was of a stature in Iberian organ music on par with that of Bach in German music for his time. Very prolific, very important. Um, he was also a priest and an organist for more than 45 years for most of his life. There are no portraits of him, no paintings were ever made. So it's a great mystery what he looks like, but he left many, many works for organ as well as choral works that go up to 13 parts. But this is the Bataya Imperial, and if you have trumpets or have a very festive day, this is a lot of fun, and pedal is somewhat optional. You may recognize it. <laughs>
delightful. It was misattributed for a time to Johann Kasper Carroll, but now we believe we've sorted that out and the manuscript really is from Cabanillas. Another work, another offertoire for the Feast of Easter from Jean-Francois d'Andreu, who was born in Paris, another child prodigy musician who first played harpsichord for King Louis XIV of France when he was five. Very small, that must have been rather intimidating. But he was a church organist and left us probably most prominently Noels for the organ. This is a fantastic piece, again, for Easter, rather. You may recognize this. We all have organs with reeds like that, right? All of us, we just, we get to play them every day. We could learn this for Easter, there's still time, but it's a really fantastic piece of music that we don't play so often because we do have wonderful things to choose from, but this is one that I think should be known. Um, the abbot Henri Delapine was born in France and died in another smaller area. He was another Catholic priest, professor, composer, and publisher, ordained in 1894 and left us just a little bit of music, but this march is a sortie. It's very charming. or harmonium, so it's just Manuelator. shorter work, about three and a half minutes, but very versatile and very delightful. Moving back to England again, the name George Dyson may be familiar to you if you serve an Episcopal church because of a great deal of the service music he wrote. He studied at the Royal College of Music in London and served in the army for the First World War. He was also a schoolmaster and college lecturer. He was a very traditional composer uh, in his style. He studied with Perry and Stanford to give you some indication, uh, but he had a very good reputation and there has been a trust established now in 1998 for further study of his music and his manuscripts and his compositions. He didn't leave us a ton. He wrote some spectacular chamber music, but this is a really lovely postlude by George Dyson. wonderful development section. It's a very challenging piece, but really very, very lovely. Staying in England, Alfred Hollins 
was an important and interesting composer. He was also a teacher and an organist. Noted as a recitalist in Scotland, he traveled a great deal. He was blind from birth, as were a number of very important organists, but it's rumored that he had perfect pitch and even as a child was very, very precocious and he was later awarded several honorary doctorates. He wrote a great deal of organ music and we don't hear it so often, but it's delightful. So I have included two scores on your handout and this is a bit of his triumphal march. Very genial piece, very, very attractive, very fun to listen to. Something that's a little more angular and much shorter that's very useful for a number of things. Francis Allen Jackson was born in 1970 and is still living. I believe he uh, is long past his 100th birthday at this point, but left fabulous, fabulous music for us. He studied under Sir Edward Bairstow and was a chorister at York Minster, and he was later appointed organist and director at York Minster in 1946 and held that position until his retirement in 1982. But again, he has now long surpassed his 100th birthday, and I've seen recent videos of him being honored or speaking at places. He is a very, very interesting organist and composer and has given recitals all over the world, but this is called the Archbishop's Fanfare. I wish it was longer, but it's a fantastic piece um, and very, very useful, particularly if, again, you have trumpets or a tuba or something wonderful like that. Another living composer whom I esteem greatly is Richelle Laurent, Canadian musician, composer, and music educator. I believe she lives in Quebec, and she was commissioned, among other things, to write a wonderful piece for the Atlanta 2020 convention, but she's very prolific, has written some extraordinary music, often very virtuosic, very, very exciting. She's received a number of awards for her music and composes very, very actively. This is her Royal Canadian fanfare. Very interesting, very playful piece. 
staying with the theme of living female composers. Dr. Brenda Portman is a fantastic, incredibly gifted organist and composer, and she's very, very much in demand as both a concert organist and a composer. She is the resident organist at Hyde Park Community United Methodist Church in Cincinnati, where they have a very renowned concert series. She's won the AAGO certificate with the highest exam score prize, and she also was commissioned to write a work for the Atlanta uh, AGO 2020, but she's really stunning. I have two pieces of hers on here, and I'll let you know that the second one, the Takata for America, when I wrote to her about this, it wasn't yet available for sale. So she has gone out of her way to put this for sale on sheetmusic.com exclusively for us by request. It's a wonderful piece, and the recording we'll listen to is of her playing her own Takata for America. We won't make it all the way to the end because I'm watching the clock tick down and we're only getting to the letter P in the alphabet. But there are quotes from the Stars and Stripes at the end of the Takata, and it's really fantastic. So here is Dr. Portman playing her own Takata for America. It's really fantastic, and this is her postlude on Joyful Joyful, also Dr. Portman herself playing. wonderful tune that's in just about every hymnal I can think of, which makes it particularly ecumenical and very, very useful. Samuel Rousseau was another French composer, organist, and opera director who studied at the Paris Conservatory. He was the organist at saint Severin and was also professor of harmony for many years at the Paris Conservatory and director of the Opera Nationale de Paris. He was very influenced as a composer by the works of Franck and Faure, but he was a master of chromatic harmony, and this is one of Rousseau's works for organ. There, I apologize for needing to skip over. This is a sortie. Just very, very charming, lovely piece. This is a work for Pentecost by a lesser-known French composer named Fernand de la Tumbelle. His name was actually much longer than that, but that is what he's known as professionally, French organist and composer from Paris, who began piano lessons very young with his mother and later studied with Alexandre Guimont and with Theodore Dubois. He was a concert organist in France and also affiliated with uh, Notre Dame. This is a suite for organ on Pentecost themes.
very beautiful music. In the interest of time, forgive me for skipping ahead just a little bit. Um, to close this out, there are two things that I'll play for you at the end. And again, from your the uh, links for these playlists are included on your handout if you would like to go back and listen to a few more things. And there are pieces included that aren't on here, and likewise, it goes back and forth. I'll close with The Marche Americaine by Charles Marie Vidor. This was originally written for piano and was transcribed for the organ by Marcel Dupre, who made it a very dramatic, very wonderful work. Vidor, we know for many, many reasons, not the least of which his 10 organ symphonies, and that he succeeded César Franck as organ professor at the Paris Conservatory and served the Church of Saint-Sulpice for much of his life. But this is the American March by Charles-Marie Vidor. Thank you so much for coming today, and I'd be glad to supply anything from this to you digitally, and uh, look forward to being in touch. Thank you again. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.